Hey everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Olson Silik, and we've got another all new show for you this week. We're gonna sit down for part two with the DNR talking about our deer herd here in Michigan, how they're managing that, especially as it pertains to CWD and some other diseases here in the deer herd. You won't wanna miss that, some pretty important information. And Jimmy and Jordan have been working on some outdoor adventures for us this week. Well, that's right, Jenny. We do have a few more adventures on this week's show. Before all this cold weather and snow showed up here in Mid Michigan, I was able to get out with some folks and do a little coho fishing while tied to a pier. You won't want to miss that. We're also going to show you what goes into making a custom call. So lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes. Here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan. Michigan out of doors. What a beautiful day in the woods. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy. The wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees. The sweet smell of nature's in the air. From the Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's destination since 1988. Featuring varieties of homemade sausage, jerky, brats, and gourmet entrees. Holiday gift boxes can be assembled in-store or online. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By AnglerQuest Pontoons, a mid-Michigan company building boats for fishermen by fishermen. AnglerQuest Pontoons are designed for comfort and functionality. On the web at anglerquestpontoons.com. by the Michigan Fly Fishing Club, presenting this year's 2019 Midwest Fly Fishing Expo. The expo is coming to Metro Detroit on March 9th and 10th at the Sports and Expo Center at Macomb Community College. For more information and details, MidwestFlyFishingExpo.com. Soaking in the rich tradition of Michigan hunting for over 30 years, Vanguard is proud to sponsor our friends at Michigan Out of Doors TV. Tim, what's the game plan here today? We're going to go out and try to catch a couple. <laughs> yeah, what are we fishing for? Uh, we're going to go for coho, and maybe there'll be a steely or a brown in there. Nice. Where are we at? We are in Port Sheldon, Michigan, heading out in between the pier heads to start. And uh, yeah, we're just going to give it a go. We had a really good Saturday, and uh, we had tons of fish on. It was nice to get back out. Uh, Saturday morning, I fished the big water out of Saugatuck, and we hammered lake trout and steelhead, and then Gabe was up here with a couple of his friends, and they did really well for coho. So, uh, weren't keeping any. So, Gabe and I came out Saturday night. What do we have, 45 on? Yeah. I think we had 45 <laughs> on that night. So, hopefully, oh we get into them like that. Well, about two weeks ago, before the winter blast, I was able to get out on a rather unique bite, fishing the warm water discharge on the Pigeon River here in West Michigan. So what's our method here? What are we going to be using, Tim? These are Gabe, Spoon Gabe Spooner specialties. Oh, yeah? Oh, Seeker man. Bait. Seeker baits filled with love. We've got all sorts of different good color spawn sacks. we got loose eggs. we got skein. One thing Gabe found out is that these coals being a little smaller, we have to go a lot smaller with our bags. Ah. Um, half of the reason that we were only, you know, hooking not even, probably a, a just third. over a quarter, maybe a third, um, our spawn sacks were too big. So as soon as we downside, they started choking it down. Okay. Now we got to do a little, little surgery on them to get our, our hook back, but we're eating them anyways. There we go. Oh, yeah. He's going to get another out. There we go. Hey, hey, hey. Not a bad one. There we go. Oh. Beautiful little fish. Perfect little eaters. Yep. If I can get them out of the net. Well, that didn't take too long. You no, know, we're about one for eight already. Right. If Gabe would start joining us here, we'd be okay. <laughs> oh, what a pretty fish. Yeah. yeah. All them and spots what size on the back. Uh, ten inches. Ten inches. And he's well over yeah, ten yeah. inches. So. These are the ones you're gonna like to eat. Perfect eaters. Yep. yep. Slide so. that in my pocket. Yep. yep. We tied front and back of the boat to the pier, and then in the spawn would go. The guys were using their long pier fishing rods, but Tim also had his bluegill rod. Just about anything would work for this style of fishing. Nice. 
Another little one. Perfect. All of these have been coming on bags. Yeah, these guys have been coming on bags. So are these fish just living here or are they traveling through? They're Well, they're traveling through and the bait has stopped here. Okay. So, just a cutie right there. There you go. Yep, so the bait has stopped here. And uh, so they came in here because of that warm water. Okay. Now, as you can see, we've downsized the bag size and we're just starting to, to hook up all the time. Okay. That's kind of the key feature right here. And uh, to be honest, I didn't know that until Gabe told me. It's funny how stories come to us here at the television show. I had bumped into Gabe Spooner's dad at a gas station and he mentioned that Gabe is becoming quite the fisherman. It's great to see a high schooler with such passion for the outdoors. He brines his own skein and teaches a lot of guys much older than him some really unique fishing opportunities here in this part of the state. Now we did have to measure a few, but we were starting to sneak up on our limit pretty quickly. Even I had to catch a few. Hey, I see silver too, it's no more shad. I need that. Okay. That thing swallowed it. This one might. Oh, nope. that's a decent one. Nope. Did you get him? 20 nope. bucks to knock him off. Tim Becker owns and runs Powderhorn Guns and Archery in Holland, a really nice little outdoor shop. But his love of fishing keeps him on the water more than in the shop. Now, Gabe here, he's my, my first mate. Him and I have been together since day one when I started running that boat. Uh, exciting news is this year we purchased a second boat nice. and uh, we're going to be running that boat full time this year too. So hopefully we're going to run a couple hundred charters and uh, be able to be able to keep rolling with that. And uh, other than that, it, it's it can be tough to catch me at the shop because I'm on the water all the time. Well, or, that's a good problem. A lot of times well, guys that don't own a sporting goods shop can never get out of there. I just, you know, I can't see that. I can't see that. But next year, Gabe and I are going to be doing this in the, the winter, too. So if you're looking to go catch some steelhead and some coho and browns and uh, even lake trout on days like today where the lake's flat, we can be out there fishing lake trout. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to try to stay busy. Here we go. I'm stuck. Is he there? Yeah. Here, Jimmy. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. That's your last one, I think. Yeah, that's yeah, that's it. Then it's all you. I'm even I'm even steep one one shad. I love it. Ready, Gabe? Yeah. There we go. Pretty All right. looking one. Boy, a little bit different real looking. Silver. Yeah. Well, All right. Well good. That makes my five. I'm all done. Well, with the bite slowing down, we moved to the end of the pier and tried it there as we were losing light. It ended up being a good oh, move. Feels like a coho. Good. Might be the last fish of the day. Might be right out of daylight. <laughs> But we got the limit, so that's good. Yep, coho. nice coho. Hey, there we go. Good fish. Good job, Gabe. <sighs> there we go. Nice good one, job, boys. Yeah. Another good eater. We had a great night. Our bite was hot and heavy for the first hour. Yep. Um, and we actually caught quite a few of them, but. You know, it went real good and it shut down for about an hour or two, uh, probably about an hour. And uh, it just started picking back up. I just lost one. Gabe just put two in the boat. And uh, we're, I think we're gonna call her quits. Yeah. Get in before that ice forms again so we don't get to bust it the whole way. <laughs> well, we had a great night. Got some really good eating fish as well. Not sure you can reach this discharge warm water anymore, but when you can, it's worth the trip. Here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, in our next segment, we're going to continue our conversation with the DNR about chronic wasting disease and deer management. That is always a very hot topic. And most of the questions that we are asking him on this week's show are from you, the viewers. And there is a fair amount of uh, discussion out there that CWD doesn't really kill very many deer. So versus what we have been doing. So can you, and I'm trying to think of where this question is here, but, uh, oh, Justin McDonald wants to know how many deer have died in Michigan from chronic wasting disease? Yeah, it's a good question. It's one we've been getting a lot lately. Um, I would say that it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because um, 
One, CWD doesn't necessarily kill the deer. It's usually complications associated with CWD that kill the deer. So most deer that have CWD and have shown those symptoms and die, they have something like pneumonia or they have something else that is killing them. But that doesn't mean that CWD is contributing to the death of the individual. It's like how um, people don't necessarily die from AIDS. They die from complications from AIDS, but those complications wouldn't exist if AIDS didn't exist. Okay. So with that being said, um, we've identified two animals that have been symptomatic with the disease in our state so far. One was our initial case in Ingham County, that first detection in free-ranging deer. She was symptomatic. She was an older doe. She was less than 100 pounds. Um, clearly had cognitive issues um, and was put down by an officer. Okay. Um, clearly visibly sick. The other what came from a landowner that reported a visibly sick deer in Jackson County. This was the first deer identified in Jackson County last summer. Uh, went out the next day and that animal had passed away. Um, but the necropsy, the cause of death is technically pneumonia. She has pneumonia in July, okay. but she's full-blown chronic wasting disease. So would you say conservatively, I mean, would you say thousands of deer, 10 deer, 50 deer? I mean, I'd heard the number in the 50s of so, deer that have died that, that we know of from chronic wasting disease. Is that wrong or right? So the number of deer that have tested positive for CWD is over 100 now. I think we're over 110 over our four-year period. Okay. Um, two of them have been symptomatic. That's not to say that if a hunter hadn't harvested those deer that they eventually wouldn't turn symptomatic and die from the disease. Um, they were just harvested before that symptom manifested itself. So I'd also say that that's also a short-term view to a long-term problem. So looking at how many deer are dying or symptomatic from the disease today doesn't necessarily translate to what it will look like in 20, 30, 40 years. Because certainly if you go to states that, are, that have been dealing with this for on a much longer timeline than we have, they're seeing more deer that have chronic wasting disease. They're finding more deer that have died from chronic wasting disease or complications from chronic wasting disease. So that's a point we don't want to get to, and that's why we're trying to take some active approaches and stances today to prevent it from getting to that point. And I think from the other side of that coin, they're saying, okay, if we've seen 100 deer this year, let's say next year it's 200 deer. You know, I did a little research, which I'm not usually known to do uh, before getting here, but we kill anywhere between 40 and 50,000 deer per year with cars. That comes down to like 120 to 130 a day from cars. Mm -hmm. And if chronic wasting disease is only gonna maybe take out 50 to 100 per year, aren't we going way overboard to say, we gotta ban baiting, we gotta kill all these deer down in Southern Michigan, South. It just seems like, like you said, for a lot of people, it's we're overreaching. Do you see where they're coming from? Or do you still feel that even if we're only taking out 100 deer a year from CWD, it's worth doing all these. Yeah, so I, I do see where they're coming from, looking at the data here and now. Uh, so part of our responsibility as an agency is to ensure the future sustainability and health of our wildlife resource. And what we do is we look at places that have been dealing with this on a timeline much longer than ours to see if we can predict what's going to happen. And when you look at places like southern Wisconsin, the farmland area that's been dealing with it since 2002 and probably realistically much, much earlier before that, um, you're finding one out of every five animals in that area affected with the disease. Hmm. And they're starting to see, they've got some active research going on now that CWD, uh, animals that have CWD are dying at three times a higher rate than animals without CWD. So these are things, and CWD, because it's ability to stay in the environment, you can't reset the clock. This is not like hemorrhagic disease, which is the viral disease that kills a lot of deer in a very short amount of time in, uh, in the fall. That's devastating to deer populations in a very quick, fast amount of time, but the deer herd recover because it's a virus, and that can't persist in the environment over time. Prions can persist in the environment over time, so what happens is you get this snowball effect. More and more animals become exposed, more and more animals become infected with it, okay. and it is a fatal disease. That's, that's the fear. That's, so the DNR is operating on, we're looking 30 years, 40 years down the road, not this year and next year. Correct, yeah, if, if you could, if, if research showed that CWD was 
present in 1% or half of a percent of our deer and it stayed at that level and it was just endemic in all of our deer and it didn't have any human health issues, which currently is not known to have, but we don't, there's still emerging research on that. If it just stayed at that, we wouldn't be having a conversation about chronic wasting disease. It's, it's what the disease looks like in decades from now. It's not what it looks like today. So you mentioned what other states are doing. So Kenneth Ritt, Rutz here wanted to know, why are you following the same example as other states yet expecting different results? Or are we doing the same thing as other states? I'm not sure that we are doing the same thing as other states. So one of the, and, and maybe what Kenneth is referring to is, you know, trying to increase the harvest of, of deer, trying to, trying to kill more deer. Some of that is for testing purposes because we want to know and, and try to map out where the disease exists. But we're also on a different timeline from a lot of people too. So we get compared to Wisconsin a lot uh, and, and it's, a, it's a just um, comparison. I mean, we're both Midwestern, North Central states, um, rich hunting tradition, um, high, uh, high number of deer in their southern uh, parts of their states, you know, much more forested in their northern parts, um, very similar. When Wisconsin first started finding CWD in 2002, that first year, they found over 200 positive animals. So their timeline was far more accelerated than what, what we've been dealing with. Um, and they, they've contributed a tremendous amount of knowledge to the overall body of research for CWD. But overall, um, the disease has continued to escalate in that, in that state. It's spread, and then where it's been first identified locally, it's increased. So we haven't tried quite the same approach that they have. Um, we're focusing more on management, where they focused initially on eradication. That's not our goal. We don't want to eradicate deer. We know that they're a valued resource. That's why we're... Well, that's a lot of people. They just want to kill off all the deer. And I think any reasonable person would say, why would, why would the department want to kill off all the deer? Now, you did, we did see an influx in you know, antlerless tags that you could get in certain parts of the state. Um, why did you guys remove the antler restrictions in those areas as well? Yeah, so the antler restrictions were removed um, because we want to make deer available for hunters to, to harvest. So we know that um, the likelihood of people harvesting two deer is probably pretty small. Um, but um, that, that four point restriction on the, on the combo license, doing away with that, opens up more deer for harvest um, once that first deer is harvested or once. But, and you guys got a lot of blowback from that, right? We did, we did. And was it worth, do you think it was worth it? I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we're going to look at the data that comes out of it this year. And if, if in any way it sacrificed our ability to manage deer or, or um, proves counterproductive in managing for the disease, um, I think we need to present that data and see if it makes a, if, if it did have an impact. But we're, we're so early in the process after our deer season ended right now that we haven't had a time to evaluate that yet. A couple more questions for you. How much money does the DNR get from insurance companies? zero that I'm aware of. Okay. I haven't seen any of it. I can tell you that. No. Um, I mean, that's a, that is a common, I, I don't want to say myth because I, I, I don't, I can't look at your books or whatever, but f from you standing here as representing the DNR, you're saying that they do not get any money from, because everybody, you know, when we look at our thousand responses that we got on this, it was like, ah, the insurance companies are in charge of everything. And so your response to that is? I, I've, I've been managing deer in two states for 12 years and I have had a grand total of zero conversations with anybody with uh, what this rumor would be associated with, the insurance side of things. Now, I, I don't expect people to believe me, um, but it doesn't exist, it doesn't. Well, there you have it. There's part two in our three-part series with our sit-down with the DNR, talking to them about deer management and chronic wasting disease. Now, I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, but there was a lot of questions that overlapped, and so we'll have more of those on next week's show. For our next segment on this week's show, we're going to do something a little bit different. A while back, I was able to sit down with a custom call maker in the Detroit area and learn all about what goes in to making a custom call. Terry Tackett with Tackett Game Calls. Um, I started to make calls 
uh, six or seven years ago after watching a PBS show on wood turning and I got pretty fascinated with watching the wood change shape you know live and you know watching that that happen so I convinced the, my wife to let me get a lathe and I got one and came into the, the shop the first time and sent wood flying everywhere um, almost hurt myself uh, didn't really know what I was doing but I stuck with it and slowly progressed from making vases and Christmas ornaments and things like that to uh, trying my hand at turkey calls after I looked at a plastic turkey call that I had and thought well I can make that so I tried and kept trying and kept trying and a lot of mistakes and eventually got a decent sounding call and then I started to refine my process from there um, included the the shape the, the materials used, the finish, the glue, everything. Did all kinds of tests on them, you know, in, one in the car, one on the deck, one in the grass, one in a mud puddle for a couple days, call I forgot in the woods, you know, <laughs> things like that, um, to, to hammer down the process that I, I wanted to use to, to put a good product out. Um, I actually never really in, had an intent to sell them um, until we had some, some medical bills pop up that it kind of was a catalyst to to make me try to make a little money on the side. Terry makes a variety of different calls and our plan today was to go through the process of how to make a deer call from start to finish. Process for a deer call is I get it drilled and once I have both portions of it drilled I put them onto an expanding mandrel, tighten it down and then I can rough out the call blank. So once I have the nice round surface I can go back and start to make my standard design. Um, each one's a little bit different. Uh, the, the template is in my mind. I don't have a, a specific template laid out in front of me. Um, a lot of times the wood dictates a lot of the, the shape. Um, some calls are generally a little bit smaller. Some of them are a little bit bigger. It depends on what the wood wants to do. Uh, you can't really force it. You have to allow it to, to be the way it wants to be. Um, so once I get my shape, I'll go through the the grits of sandpaper, 80, 120, 220, 320, 400, and then a, a scouring pad. Um, get the dust off, take it off the lathe, and then move on to the other part of the call. You could go out and spend 12 bucks and buy a turkey call, it's going to sound fine, or a deer call, it's going to sound fine. It's going to be a mass-produced thing on that's made out of plastic in a factory. Whereas, you know, a, the custom call makers are, are taking a piece of wood and specifically choosing it and, and then doing everything in the process, you know. We're, we're targeting a specific piece of a board to make a turkey call, you know. So you waste a lot of wood because you're trying to get the piece that looks the best out of there. And you're drilling it, you're putting it on the lathe, you're turning it, you're doing all the measurements, everything done to the call makes a difference. Um, with the deer call, it's kind of the same thing. You want a call that sounds good, but you also want a call that looks good. So the next step in my process is I like to take the, the blank, once I've got it turned, and soak it in Danish oil. The benefits of the Danish oil are that it soaks into the wood, so instead of just being a surface finish, I actually get into the wood to protect it from the inside out. Um, that also gives the wood a little bit of more stability if it's a softer wood because the Danish oil kind of solidifies. Um, and it also, this is the first step to really making the grain pop on the calls. So after the call is soaked in the oil for a couple hours, I like to get it out, make sure it's dry, get all the remaining oil off of it. And then I dip it into a, a mixture of mineral spirits and spar urethane. Um, the reason I use spar urethane is because it's generally intended for outdoor purposes. So it's pretty UV resistant, it's water resistant, so it's a really strong durable finish for the call. Once the call finishes drying and the internal components are added, it's ready to go. Terry, like most custom call makers around the state, doesn't do it for the money. It's all about a love of woodworking and creating a piece of art for someone else to enjoy. It's, it's a passion, it, it's addictive. You know, everything about turning on a lathe is addictive from from finding the, the right piece of wood, to drilling out the blanks, to getting it on the lathe. It's, it's really cool when you turn a piece of wood and you don't really know what's inside of it. 
until you get it round and then you can see that there's a, a really unique grain or something that stands out that you might not have seen on the blank. And then once you get it into the oil and once you go through the finishing process to see the call, the wood basically comes alive at that point. It just, it pops. Everything looks great. And, and then to put it all together and get it out the door, I love to see people be happy with the stuff I make. The whole purpose I do this, as I said, is to, to give you the call that's your favorite call and to make you happy. And that's the coolest thing to me about this whole thing is just making people happy with the stuff that I make. Sometimes it's in the woods, sometimes it's on the water, and sometimes it's in a garage. But regardless of the location, it's always great to see people passionate about the outdoors. Special thanks to Terry for inviting me out and for teaching us all a little bit more about what goes in to creating a custom call. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you join us again next week. We'll be wrapping up our series with the DNR, talking about our deer herd and the management of it here in Michigan. We're also going to take you on a squirrel hunt using a squirrel hunting dog. We had a lot of fun out there that day. You won't want to miss next week's show. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right. Online is a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. We're on all the different social media platforms and, of course, our website, Michigan Out of Doors T tv.com full episodes of the show there you can subscribe to us on youtube if you do that but whatever you do make sure that you're watching michigan out of doors every week and getting out there and enjoying this great state and all four seasons that we have here in michigan thanks so much if we don't see you in the woods or on the water hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your pbs station michigan out of doors is presented by by greenstone farm credit services making recreational land ownership possible across michigan and northeast wisconsin Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or greenstonefcs.com. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. With its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses, Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. By Showspan, producing consumer shows including Outdoorama February 28th through March 3rd at Novi's Suburban Showplace. The show features tackle, trips, boats, outfitters, wildlife encounters, and of course, Big Buck Night. That's Outdoorama in Novi, February 28th through March 3rd. When I want to far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine tree. I am a Michigan man I am, I am a Michigan man That's where I'm from and I'll show you my